Well, on Wednesday nights, we were doing a Bible study on the book of James, and it's amazing how the Holy Spirit works. This is just a set of verses that we're supposed to be on next Wednesday. So if you're coming to our Wednesday night Bible study at 6.30, don't, you don't have to worry about talking about verse, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. We're going to do it this morning. So just jump ahead to 13 and following. Everybody got that? So it'll be a full house for Bible study, Wednesday at 6.30. 45 people there, right? In person. Yeah. You know, there is ice cream, by the way. I'm just saying. Well, November of 2012, the Cornerstone Bank of Waco, Nebraska, was robbed of $6,000. Now, the bank tellers who were a part of this uh, devious crime could describe the teenage girl and the escape vehicle that she used, the getaway car that she used, dash away. See, it was all fresh in their minds. But it, as it turned out, the investigators investigating this robbery didn't really need to rely too much on that eyewitness account of what happened that day. See, it was on YouTube. And it was entitled, Chick Bank Robber. You see, fanning out this wad of cash in front of her, Hannah Sabata said, as she fanned this cash out, she held up a sign that said, I just stole a car. I robbed a bank and now I'm rich. I'm going to pay off my student debt and go on a shopping spree. On video, YouTube, Dick Bank Robber. Then what she did was she held up another uh, sign and it said, I told my mom that this was the best day of my whole entire life. He thinks I met a boy. Well, obviously, if you put it on YouTube and you hold the signs up, you've made your confession to the world and it wasn't long, only about a week before the authorities showed up on her door and arrested her for bank robbery. Well, I think we've all done some pretty stupid things in our lives. Maybe not bank robbery, right? But even worse than that, have there been times in your life when you've said something that's gotten you into even more trouble than what you've done. Is there a time in your life in which you, you wish with all that's inside you that you could just take back your words? I know for me, that's about a daily thing. Right, Tammy? Amen. You see... A lot of times, our words, sometimes they come out, a lot of times they come out as lies or gossip or criticism or slander, and those words do great damage to those we love, those we may not even know, still have a profound effect. And the Bible says, you know, it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles a person, it's what comes out of your mouth that defiles. Because what comes out reveals what's in your heart. Think about that for a minute. Because the stakes are high. Our words can either speak life into someone or speak death. Our tongues can build up or tear down. And it's been said that great minds think about ideas and talk about ideas. Small minds, they discuss people. James knew all about small-minded people. He's writing to uh, people who are, in a sense, very small-minded because, yeah, they don't murder people. They don't, um, they don't cheat. They don't steal. They don't do some of those big things, you know, the Ten Commandments sins. But with their mouths, they're doing great harm. They're tearing people down. Within the fellowship, they're gossiping about one another, spreading rumors about one another. Husbands are stabbing their wives with cruel words sharp as daggers. 
Wives are cutting their husbands to bits with their tongue. Parents are devastating their children with criticism. That is venom. Children have exploded on their parents with volleys, hurtful and harmful. A couple weeks ago we were in the book of James and we heard these words in chapter 1, verse 19. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. If any of you think you're religious and do not bridle your tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. See, a lot of times our words do become our actions, don't they? What we speak out of our mouths becomes how we behave or how we respond to others. And you need to be careful of that because of the harm that can be done. The tongue can express or repress, offend or befriend, affirm or alienate, build up or belittle, comfort or criticize, delight, destroy. Starting in verse 12, James, gives us four images, four pictures, picture stories. Think about the power of the tongue and the power of our words. First, he talks about the bit in the horse's mouth. Then he talks about the rudder of a ship. Then a fire. Finally, he talks about a spring of water. Now, he uses these images to help us to understand that You know, when we speak things, we need to speak things that build up. That there's power in the words we speak. You think about the the horse in in the bridle in the horse's mouth, the bit. Now, the horse would have been a powerful military symbol. It it the horse in that time represented strength and power. But that small bit within the horse's mouth can move that horse left or right or stop that horse, right? Maybe it's time that take the strength of the tongue and put a stop to the hateful words that we might be thinking, want to say. The next thing he compares it to is a rudder of a ship, and he says, you know, the ship is huge, again, a symbol of commerce, of wealth, of fame, of, uh, of prowess again. But yet that small rudder controls that entire ship like the tongue controls our lives. It controls it against the wind. It wants to push the ship one way, but the rudder can fight the wind and push it another way. So whether it's the bit or the rudder, you have to have a strong hand and a strong mind to be in control that little thing in our mouths that get us in so much trouble. The next thing, and I hinted about the children's sermon, right? The the fire, the spark that can start a massive fire and do great damage. You know, I I remember um, my family was living in a little apartment building, and uh, I guess it must have been around the 4th of July because I had a pocket full of fireworks. And uh, as a teenage boy in a pocket full of fireworks, that's just trouble waiting to happen, isn't it? So I can remember, you know, my mom's getting ready to go to work, and I'm just up to no good, and I'm lighting these firecrackers, and I light the first one, and it's going, and I throw it into this big grassy field behind the apartment complex. Well, it pops. But even before it pops, All the grass around it seems to explode into a massive fire, and before you know it, this fire is out of control. I run and get a towel, and I'm starting to beat it out. And my mom walks in and says, what are you doing, Tommy? It seemed that maybe the landlord had poured some gasoline on that particular part of the field, but that small spark from that firework almost got me in some serious, serious trouble. That's all it takes. Think about the words 
that are so small that we speak but can do great harm or direct that conversation that we're having, that can influence the outcome of a conversation. Small words. If. No. So. But. Small words, right? But they can really direct a conversation or they can do great harm. Let me just give you an example. Have you ever been in a, a I won't say argument, because I don't argue with people. But I have heated discussions. Right? So I'll be busy on the front half apologizing. Well, you know, I'm really sorry I did that. You know, I feel really bad that I did that. Then that little word gets in there, right? But, <laughs> which negates everything I just said before that word, right? It means, yeah, but it's still your fault. I'm sorry, but it's still your fault. Or if you wouldn't have done this, I wouldn't have done that. You've got to be careful of those small words because they're like a smart spark that can do great damage. They fly into our homes, creating firestorms, devastate families and friends. Think about those small words as well. Uh, how many of you remember the singer Karen Carpenter? She died very young, right? A heart of heart failure at age 32. Part of her health difficulties stemmed from someone's letter that she would, a letter that was sent that said, well, he was, he was referring to her and he called her Richard's chubby sister. You know Karen Carpenter's story, you know that she struggled with anorexia. I'm sure complicated her heart condition. Those small words influenced her whole life. Now we heard it before, sticks and stones can break your bones, but words can never hurt you. Not too sure about that. I was thinking about this message today and Thinking about people that I can't really even remember their full name. But yet they spoke a word to me, criticism, that influenced my life. Sure, you can think about people who have done the same for you. People who have criticized rather than built up. And influenced your life in, in a negative, negative way. Well, finally, he says that it's like a spring of fresh water. You can't have fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring. That's impossible. And here, he's pointing to what's going on once again in this fellowship that he's writing to. You know, on the one hand, they think they're righteous, but on the other hand, they're spreading these rumors. On the one hand, they believe they're a blessing, but then they're blasting other people with their tongues. On the one hand, they're giving all these compliments, and on the other hand, they're cursing one another. In other words, James is saying, be consistent. And to emphasize that point, he says that, there, that the tongue is set forth by, or set ablaze by the fires of hell. I mean, you can't get much more poignant than that, can you? And James doesn't mince words, if you remember from Bible study or whatever. So what are we going to do? How can we resolve and... and uh, remedy the situation. You know that one suggestion and that uh, when I was away on retreat, uh, we did this in the mornings. We read Psalm 31, or uh, Proverbs rather, we read one of the Proverbs every day of the week because there are 31 Proverbs and there's at least 31 days of the month, right? And then we would read a piece of Scripture. What if you did that? What if you made the decision to read one of the Proverbs each and every day along with a, a, a chapter of Scripture? You know, after a month, if, like, let's say you, you chose the book of James for your first month. After a month, you'd have read the entire book of Proverbs once and James six times. And almost every one of the Proverbs says something about controlling our tongue. What if we made a commitment 
to allow our minds and our tongues and our words to be shaped by the Word of God. The second thing is, your words, are your words flowers, flames, or flowers? Woo! Lost it again. Are your words flames, flowers? There's an acronym out there. You may have seen it. It's pretty common. But it's an acronym for the word think. Seen it? It's about before you open your mouth, think with your head. How many people, you get in a heated argument and you get on your phone or you get on the Facebook and you're going to show them, right? You're busy typing away. And you hit send before you even think about the possible repercussions of that conversation or that text message. And before you know it, red, white, let's fight. It's on. Why? We need to stop and reflect and think before we act. So the T in think is, is it true? How many times do we work on half knowledge? Well, it it probably is true. But you know... Some of the most outrageous things are most likely to be false. So T is for truth. H, is it helpful? Is it part of a solution or does it just add to the problem? Is it a good thing? Is it going to help other people? Is it going to help resolve an issue? I, is it inspiring? Is it building people up or tearing people down? Is it even necessary? Think how many little things irritate us during the day that get under our skin for whatever reason it is, and we react. Is it going to matter tomorrow? Is it going to matter next week? Is it going to matter a month from now? Is it going to matter a year from now? Five years, take it out as far as you want. Is it really necessary for you to respond and to participate in the conversation? You know, every argument you're invited to, you don't have to participate in. Right? Hey, is it kind? Are your words based on a heart that truly cares for others? So think before you speak. The third thing we can do to tame our tongues is to talk less. Just talk less. Abraham Lincoln said it this way. He said, it's better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and prove it. Another president, Calvin Coolidge, said, I've never been hurt by anything I did not say. Think about that. Talk less. You know, there was a young man, his name was John, and he got a parrot for a gift, and This parrot was pretty uh, rough around the edges. I guess it grew up in a bar or something because every other word that this parrot said was a cuss word. And it was always full of insults. It never said anything nice. And John did everything that he could possibly think of to stop this parrot from hurling insults and cussing in profane, profane language. And he played soft music and he would try to talk really nice to the parrot to get him to change his tune. But nothing seemed to work. And one day the parrot was going on a rampage and just cussing up a storm and telling John he was a useless, you know, pet owner and everything else and that the food that he got stunk. And he was just going on. And John got so desperate, he just grabbed the parrot, ran over to the freezer, threw the parrot in the freezer, shut the door, and walked away. John was growing concerned because after a couple of in it, you know, there was nothing coming out of the refrigerator, the freezer. No squawking, no hollering, no profanity, just silence. That parrot didn't speak a word. So John ran over to the freezer feeling a little guilty and hoping that he'd find his parrot safe, and he opens the freezer, and before John could even get a word out, the parrot started to speak. He said, I believe that I may have offended you, and for this I am truly sorry for my rude language and actions. I'm sincerely remorseful for my inappropriate transgressions and fully intend to do everything within my power to correct my rude and unforgivable behavior. 
Herod's attitude was totally different. And just before John was going to ask the parrot what had changed, why this dramatic you know, shift in behavior, the parrot continued. John, can I ask you what the turkey did? Sometimes it's good to speak less. Fourth, build up one another. The Scriptures are consistently reminding us to encourage one another with our words. And there's power in that. There's power in speaking positive things over people. Uh, I just thought of a story. I'm going to throw it out there. So, uh, my grandson, Gage, when he was born, they did some, some blood work on him. I don't know if it was routine or they suspected something. But anyway, they did this blood work on him. And they found out that he was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. Now, that's a nerve ailment that can be quite painful and affect your life in a very profound, negative way. And, you know, so Brian and Emily, his parents, uh, you know, they were course, very concerned, almost devastated at first, but they decided, well, we're just going to pray about this. We're going to pray over Gage, and you know, whatever happens, happens, but we're going to stay positive and only speak positive things over Gage. And so they just started speaking words of joy and happiness and health into Gage's life, and you know, if you ever met Gage, he hadn't been here recently, but He's about four or five years old now. He started kindergarten this year, so I guess he's almost five. And, uh, but he's just a bundle of energy. You never, ever see him without a smile on his face. He's just, you know, he's one of those kids that, uh, well, you know, I'm sure I'm biased and everything, but I'm just saying. Joy just comes from that kid. And he's so encouraging to other people, even at five years old. Well, long story short, obviously the words that they spoke over Gage for joy and happiness and healing shaped his attitude towards life. But also, not only that, but it shaped his disease. A little while ago, he went back to the doctor and they did another test to see where the cystic fibrosis the words of prayer that were spoken over him relieved him of that condition. Amazing. Miracle. The words have tremendous power, folks. The words we pray can build, create healing for people and they can build each other up and change their lives. So there you go. Control your tongues because we can either speak life or do great harm with the words that we speak to one another. Use life. Speak life. Remember, is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Is it kind? Sometimes we may need to speak less. Sometimes we need to get deeper into God's Word. Sometimes need to speak words that bring that life. So it's time. Time to think about the words we speak. Time to speak words of life.